So I think what would be really good is our wonderful colleague Natalia is online from NIH. So uh, Natalia, I tried to fill in for you, but I'm not you. I don't have your brain for this. Um, do you want to say a few words about CSR and their role in the Smart Health Program? Sure, okay. sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, now you can hear me. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I, I can hear myself too. Should I mute myself somehow? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be here. My name is Natalia Komisarova, and I am a scientific review officer for the Center of Scientific Review at the NIH. Uh, and NIH scientific review officers, or SROs, are included in the NSF meetings to ensure that NIH review criteria are evaluated and that NIH scores are given to each application. So once the discussion and um, NSF, the NSF scores are given, then the SRO from C, like me pitches in and uh, ask the reviewers to evaluate NIH related criteria. And I have maybe five minutes to talk about it. Should I talk into some, in some detail about this? What do you want, Wendy? I think you can keep it at a high level now, Natalia, because we did the review, um, but we didn't we didn't really talk about the NIH significance and the things that you were worried about. So maybe you could talk at a high level. Right. Okay. Let me try to be to be quick, not to take too much time. So there are some differences between the NIH and NSF review, uh, because the mission of NIH is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen length life, and reduce illness and disability. So we have two components: basic science and translational science. And, uh, and there are some differences, as I said, NIH usually does not, NSF usually does not let the health impact drive the ranking. It is a little different for the SCH initiative, but uh, health um, rela re relation uh, is important for the NIH. Unlike NSF, NIH evaluation does not account for broader impact activities, education and all that. So this will be distracted from the reviewer's judgment. The NSF review rates applications using qualitative recommendations, but in the NIH review, we use quantitative descriptors, and uh, which is expressed as overall impact scores for the application. And finally, NIH review does not seek consensus and allows for a difference of opinion among these reviewers. Uh, overall impact, right, which is expressed in the score, which finally is a major decisive factor whether NIH wants or does not fund, want to fund a particular application. It reflects the likelihood for a project to exert a sustained, powerful influence on research fields involved. And there was a beautiful uh, slide which talked about what is a high overall impact, uh, scores one to three, meaning that successful completion of the aims will make a contribution of high importance to the field and may have some or no weaknesses. And then there is medium um, impact and low impact application, which is which rests on the balance between the significance or potential of, an, of a project to bring um, advancement to our knowledge or practice, and if everything is ideal, right? And then the, everything, the reality, um, weaknesses in the other criteria, which in the end um, f uh, go into the overall impact score. And in addition to this, important um, criteria and actually our overall impact score includes significance, investigator, innovation, approach and environment, which is similar, I assume, is for the NSF. We have also additional score driving considerations. We, they are marked just acceptable, unacceptable or not applicable, but they are important part of an IH review. And these are protection of human subjects, inclusion of women, minorities and individuals across the lifespan, uh, vertebrate animals, justification of the species and protection measures, and biohazards. This is personnel training and protection for biohazards. All these uh, come uh, are taken into account in the overall impact score, and this is what the NIH SRO asks the reviewers to evaluate. Okay, and then the reviewers give us their overall impact score. We write them down. They write them down, and then we calculate how this overall impact score, the average one, falls across all the applications that have been reviewed at CSR, Center for Scientific Review, 
uh, in the same council round and therefore uh, the, then the ICs make a decision where they want or do, do not want to fund a particular application. Is that right, the IC part? Yes. Okay. That's uh, in the nutshell what we do. Thank you, Natalia. Um, I, that, that, we didn't get the NIH part before, so thank you, Natalia, for doing that. Were there sure. questions about the review process before we start the final panel? I, I will say an average review is more between, I don't know, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour. Contentious could go an hour. But on average, a proposal takes about a half hour to review. Um, we don't review all in one spot. Reviews are done ahead of time. They're discussed in the panel, and then next day we write a summary. So there's a can negotiation back and forth. Like Natalia said, we don't actually try to get consensus, but we get an agreement on what the ranking should be, the final ranking, but we actually record differences of opinion and we will write. There was an argument in the panel about something for us. So um, <clears throat> We, we try to try to do that. So what you saw was really quite faithful. A little abbreviated, sorry. I was prodding people, so I'm sorry. Um, it was abbreviated, but it would have, that was a very true to that spirit. So, all right, I'm handing back to you. We're done with review. So, uh, the, uh, Mark, the review session, maybe this is the last part that Natalia asked for the reviewers to provide everyone to that, or that? I think we ended up with about five, so. I, I tell you, I channeled you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. So we'll now let's go to our next uh, uh, question. So this is a panel discussion. Um, so um, I'm going to ask a few questions to our panelists. I try to use a very common question. And mm -hmm. after I ask a few questions, you guys and people attending attend in virtual to ask the questions as well. Um, my first question is to uh, Dr. Wendy Nielsen and Taylor. So, uh, what are the common characteristics of a successful proposal? Yeah, I'll start. So, I think you saw it in the review. Um, the things the proposal went down on was, you know, there was it was a very steep technical proposal, but they didn't highlight their innovation. It wasn't clear. You can write a lot of technical, but it doesn't mean it's new technical. They didn't, they were vague, right? So where were the data? What were the data? Were they the right data for what we were doing? What were the metrics? Um, you know, we didn't have metrics for that proposal, both in the biomedical sphere or the technical sphere. So um, we're looking for a proposal that I think Amarda's comment early on should hook you from page one. The problem's important, but the innovations are clear. Spell it out, brag it, right? This is going to transform. That proposal had five thrusts, and we're not sure where the transformations were. It would have been better with less thrusts. And really saying, this transforms us in this way, this transforms us in this way. And repeat that, but make sure and back it up in a linear way through the proposal. They think she choose to comment. It has to, it starts in the intellectual merit right on page one. And it should track through. How does it do this? How does it do this? How does it do this? All the way through. So, Dana? Yeah, and just to add to what Wendy said, I think it's really important to have, again, the right team. You know, not just throwing somebody on because you think you need to have a clinician or you think you need to have somebody with this expertise. It really needs to be the right team and being able to demonstrate how you're actually going to collaborate and foster that within your proposal to accomplish the work. I'll also say too, it's really important, unlike NIH applications where you're really focused on the health first, it's really, really important, like Wendy said, to focus on drawing people into that fundamental science on page one and then interweaving within that to help. It's not the health up front and then talking on the back end about how you need to do some data imputation or we're going to do some machine learning. And it's sort of nice work from that. Thank you, Wendy and Dana. So that is very helpful and it is successful for our very guys. Um, yeah, I ask you the successful characteristics. So my second question is, what are the 
come and meet the SBI open make this podcast proposals and how can they avoid them? Uh, this question is for Wendy, Ben, and Mahavi, yeah. because you guys have really a lot of proposals. I mean, I would say creating the space that you can do to sort of rectify from the outside is just talking to the program director, the NSF and NIH. So sending that email of your one pager to the NSF Smart Connected Health email, I think will make sure that you're fitting your proposal to what it is that's interesting to the program, tailoring your application to what NSF wants in their application, as well as Making sure what you're writing is of interest health wise to the, to the institution center. And so I think out the gate, starting there is a place where a lot of people just fail. We get a lot of people who, if they would have just talked to us before they apply, probably would have been successful. And the other thing I want to say is when you're thinking of the problem you're going to solve, use NIH Reporter to look at what's being done at the NIH. Use our awards database. You, I can't tell you how many proposals come in replicating what's been done. Don't do that. You know, they may not be impressive, <clears throat> and they also may not be impressed in the journals you're reading. So you really want to think about looking at these up and saying, you know, um, what's been done for you. Want a team member? I mean, if you know, if your expertise is, is in a technical area. You want to have a team member who is an expert. I will say, you know, we get heart surgeons coming in on heart failure. Heart failure is not a surgical problem, right? So the, it's a you know, chronic disease. So having a surgeon tell you as your expert on that, it's like, you know, all hearts are alike. We'll just get somebody to start hearts. You want somebody who's a really expert researcher in the area who knows exactly what's been done. You're not going to do seizures in sleep with somebody who, who happens to not know seizures, but well, I got some neurological stuff. No, you want, so you want to have top cutting edge people on both sides. I think that that's a, that's a we, we see so many times that they bring in somebody who's not a researcher as the, as the main expert in that. You know, the research is so far ahead of what happens in the world that you really want to make sure you have a research expertise on both sides. Like, you wouldn't go to your local place and for computing grab a data scientist out of, the, out of your, you know, out of a company. Oh, let's get a data scientist out of here. Then somebody with a master's. You don't do that. You want that. This is a research effort, and you want good research. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. So, Natalia, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm just going to say that I Yes, do you have any addition to Wendy and Ben? Yes, how these days? So, for NIH success, the most successful application that NIH is looking for, as I was trying to convey, is that we are significance driven. So, we kind of, for, for the first stage, we pretend that everything works out exactly as proposed. This is the first question that we instruct our reviewers to evaluate in a perfect world would this application make a significant adv advancement to our knowledge or clinical practice? And if the answer is no, then it doesn't matter if there are strengths or weaknesses in the investigator environment or the approach, right? This is already secondary. But of course, you cannot get a high overall impact without all these criteria also to be strong. But significance, like the, uh, what, what we tell our applicants is, should it be done is the first question. Then will it be done? Could it be done? Right? This is the second question. And then will it be done based on the specific, um, uh, you know, track record of the investigator and the environment? But should it be done? Could it be done? And will it be done? Those are the other three questions that we are looking at. Can I, can I add one point to that? Because I think Natalia made a great point. We have risk at NSF because these are very early stage projects. So it's, it's a little more risky. But if there's a big risk in the proposal, you need to tell us how you're going to mitigate that risk. So if you say, my our first thrust is this, but it's risky and it might not work, is there a backup strategy? Because then the panel's going to say, oh, these people understand that what the challenge is really is. And we'll, 
So give you the benefit because you thought that that's when you get the significance of NIH too, because you thought through and mitigated what you can't solve all the problems, but you have to say, I understand why where this might go wrong. Can we can we add things? Sure. sure. Absolutely. Um, so I'm a standing member for NIH. So um, I did three NIH. I did three NIH panels last year, and we get a lot of machine learning um, proposals. And I find the ones there's two that are difficult to read, or I, I want to say sometimes painful. Like either they describe machine learning at such a high level that it is not at all useful, and it. It, it just takes up space in the proposal and it's not, it kind of lowers your confidence in the teams if they're describing machine learning at, at such a high, high level. And then the opposite problem that, that I see a lot is that the machine learning is described on some, such minute detail that you're really, it makes it very challenging as a reviewer to see like, what is the innovation and like why like what yeah what is novel in in the machine learning application and just what they're doing um sometimes we just, you get proposals just with like pages of formula and it's very difficult to review those and very frequently they're they're not successful so i i think we if you're going up, uh, use machine learning. I think some formula are necessary, um, and there should be some deep, something deep in there. But you do have to explain to the reviewer what, at a high level, what you are doing and what the novelty of the machine learning approach is, or the application. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. So, Dr. Ozan, I'm actually do have any. Addition to my first two questions, six features of successful proposal come up in these days. Add, add one more kind of little style to the extreme case, but it's actually a proposal to be reviewed soon, also. I wouldn't say anything further, but so the, the significance, the background and significance from the NIH kind of star is clear, the disease area is all clear, and then when it comes to approach or research strategy, start to let why be um, something, you know, normal random distribution, and we're going to optimize, uh, uh, you know, I based on P parameters, and then, and, and then start over there. So there's a, there's a huge gap from the background significance to the actual technical approach. There's no effort. Whenever that happens, it's almost like death and arrival because what you may, it's like written by two different people and written in two different styles. The approach is completely just a technical paper. The previous is just high level you know, overview of the disease. Here. So it doesn't work that way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, my next question, because my health is as long as I have been in a program, so actually I have been asked many times, so how to make the decision about defining the NIH or the NIH science? So uh, I guess this is question for them, uh, what do you wish? Yeah, so the applications, uh, like we talked about, they go to NSF, they get reviewed at NSF, and then we have an SRO there, they get an NIH score, an NSF score, and they're percentile too on the NIH side. And NSF graciously <laughs> allows <laughs> NIH program staff to take a look at the scores once they come in. And there is a process by which Bing Lu and I um, corral our fellow program officers at NIH to look at those scores and tell us of those um, that are sort of the highest um, scoring, which of those the, the institutes or centers would like to come over to, to NIH. 
Um, once those selections are made on the NIH side, um, our NSF colleagues sort of facilitate the process of reaching out to the PIs and letting them know that their application has been selected to come over to, to NIH. And there's a process by which the PIs will submit that application in the NIH form. It's basically similar, almost fully, um, to the extent possible, uh, the same as what's submitted to NSF, but you put it into NIH. There's a mock um, review that Natalia conducts to make sure that the scores are put into the system and it goes to council like it normally would at, at um, an institute or center at NIH and then is funded. Is anything? Oh. Okay. No, so NSF, we, we find that we have so many proposals that we're happy funding that we're really, we, we are very comfortable giving NIH the first chance they got more money. So we figure it's a, it's a good way to do it. Maybe they get the first chance and we get plenty of great stuff to come into. Thank you. You missed a big part. Our office current called Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Thank for the, I will say, so ODSS does provide co funding. Um, but I think from a PI's perspective, I think one, one thing that Wendy and I, having both sat in an OD office, also realize is that it's confusing for the PIs as well because PIs cannot go to ODSS or to the Office of Behavioral Social Sciences Research and ask for that co-funding. It's something that ODSS provides an opportunity to the program officers to request. So just as a point of clarification. Yeah, that's correct. Um, that's the thing. <laughs> so uh, it's an internal process. So my, my next question, I think, is specific for you guys. <laughs> yes. So we, I know you, you are all very successful in smart health program. So what is the biggest challenge when you develop the process? Yeah. Yeah. Biggest the challenge, I think, and I was just talking to um, Wendy, with that, from my, my just personal experience with that, uh, I think I have a good team and good good work and some good designs there. I was I was trying to really understand um, how to make this proposal responsive to this program because that's the first time I do this. I think I made a mistake that I didn't contact the program director to you know um, communicate about that, um, um, which I will do in the future. Uh, but I think that's for me, that's really the biggest uh, challenge. I want to really want to make sure that I complete that program. I don't want to spend a lot of time and assign the team. You know, I'm confident that we have a good team and doing things that we've done a long time. Um, I want it to be to be something responsive and safe, so that get uh, they uh, can be really you know, reviewed in the panel. And I want to say, say this is good, but it's not for our program. Something like that. I try to avoid that. So I really you know want to echo that. If you have something not very sure. Just you know, try to talk to the program director, so that could be very, very helpful. I think. Yeah, the biggest challenge <laughs> for me uh, for this program, and actually in general for all the proposals, is that sometimes you have a good idea, you have good te technology or techniques, um, some even preliminary results. It's where how do you tell uh, integrate it coherently? Stories so that it's you know it has science, it has impact, and all of those. Assimilating that and uh, writing that in a way that the viewer can appreciate that's the most challenging part. It, it's hard work, and it, there's no shortcut for that. For some of the unsuccessful proposals, I feel like they're they're not putting enough of their time and effort into this aspect. They may have great ideas, but the the writing, the integration of the information, the flow of the proposal, all of those needs to, um, to be paid great attention to. And actually, when I write, I actually jokingly calculate each line is like worth $2,000. If you're lying there, it doesn't <laughs> worth $2,000. If it doesn't, don't put it there. Um, so actually, uh, you took the words out of my note. I think the, the hardest part for me was um, just actually writing the proposal. 
Um, we have the team together. We knew what we wanted to do. Um, but the first time that we submitted the proposal, somehow the main ideas were not conveyed as much as I expected them to be um, by the reviewers, by, or yeah, by the panelists. Um, so I found that very frustrating, um, and it's not specific just to smart and connected health, happens all the time. Um, so I think just sometimes trying to read it as a reviewer and not as the investigator, it can be really hard. Um, and trying to take a step back, sometimes you're just so close to your work that you don't see the mistakes in it. Um, so you have to try really hard, I think, to um, see the faults or see what can be improved within the proposal um, and to try and revise it and sharpen your, your voice in the proposal and what, what you want to be, what, what you want to come through. Um, you know, this is the challenging aspect to me almost always is, um, yeah just actually writing the proposal and in a way that I am conveying all the ideas that I want to. I think I can confirm that Katie's is a little bit different. A lot of the work is also in managing your team, right? Because one of you will have to be the cheerleader. Maybe you have a good team, it's three, four, five people, however many. So there needs to be one that brings you together. One that says, hey, we need a schedule twice a week or three times a week. Um, hey, you need to start talking to each other. Uh, hey, here is how we separate the tasks. Hey, this is not on here anymore. Hey, can you rewrite this? Right? So that it's almost um, science of team science, right? Because increasingly our projects are becoming multidisciplinary. They are not written by a single PI, but written by several PIs. So putting in the time to manage the team, right? Factoring in the amount of time that you need in order to get to a good product, that's also something you can easily underestimate, but it goes a long way towards ensuring a responsive proposal. Yeah, I'm using fast experience So my next question. So, uh, hello. As Ben just mentioned, so if NIH decided to bring a proposal back to NIH and the PI, they have to resubmit the proposal to NIH. We all know to, start to prepare the proposal and study it to NIH and regarding the review but to be funded. This is a, a lot of work and a long process. So, many PIs have concerns. Uh, so, Latamia, can you tell us what is the uh, Suggestion you had uh, on this process and uh, how to mitigate the concerns from <laughs> PIs. Okay, so the question is to me. Okay. So the question is about resubmitting the application to NIH, right? And if it's worth the effort, kind of. Okay, so one, you definitely. So you will be notified by uh, Dana or Wendy if your application is kind of most likely will be funded by the IC. So if you have to do the work of reformatting your proposal to the NIH form, means that your chances are very, very high to be funded. So I think that loan makes, you know, may make the work worthwhile. Second, yes, you do reformat your proposal to the NIH format, but not exactly. So the it's it will be funded as an R01 application, but still you are allowed to keep the 15 pages of your research strategy, right? Which you, you don't really have to rewrite your application. And practically you should um, not change um, any content, right? Because NIH is going to fund exactly what you submitted to NSF. 
Right. So, so uh, now you rewrite this uh, your application and then you email it to our division of receipt and referral. This may change. We may uh, change the um, submission process, but this is how it works. And that's practically it on your part, right? And then, as then said, um, I have a mock review of these applications. Mock review means that I'm using the reviews and the scores that already have been submitted by the reviewers, and then I release a summary statement to you and to the program officers which are based on the summary statement that you created uh, already by um, for nsf right and then you are in the hands of the ics so um, i think that the pi is here that gone through this procedure will be better people to tell you how difficult it is but from my perspective it's worth it right sure thank you Nathan. i can tackle one part with you have uh, experience with this process, <laughs> we started your purpose to, to match. So, what is your opinion about this resubmission process? Yeah, to me, the the proposal transformation are quite straightforward. The objectives became aims and things like that. But there's a little bit of um, um, negotiation or work that needed, whether it's I think I actually communicated with Wendy. Um, for NI, for NSF, you have PI and CoPI. For NIH, you have PI and MPI, PI, MPI, and CoI. There are three layers. Which one should be mapped to what? So I, in the end, actually, when they hinted, you know, the the fewer the PIs, the easier to manage the project. So I. Um, went from uh, single PI uh, and after consultation with other um, co-PIs from the NIH label um, and, that, and uh, I think that worked well. Could I, uh, Finglo, could I add to this uh, actually very important comment about PIs and multi-PI. There is a situation when some investigators qualify to the category which is called early uh, early stage investigator at an age, and I see Diana nodding your head. <laughs> yes, this means that you have defended your PhD since uh, 10 years, 10 years ago. Being an ESI early stage investigator gives you advantage in terms of uh, the IC pay line, right? So some with certain scores you will not get um, your, your application funded unless you are an ESI. So here we did face difficulties. One, you, your NIH profile should clearly mark you as ESI. You, that's on the PI, on the PI's, PI's job. And second, um, as the, pre the previous speaker mentioned, multi PI. If you turn one of your collaborators into multi-PI who is not qualified to be an ESI, then you lose the advantage. But if this person comes as co-investigator, that is okay. So be very mindful of this conversion. So I want to, I want to say here, if the one thing you should be getting out of this, when you have questions, you should be talking to your, I send an email, introduce you to the NIH people. You can ask them, you can ask me, I don't answer NIH questions, but if something comes up and you're thinking, I don't think that's the way it is, email me. You, we want to talk to people and say, here's the question. So if you have PI questions, early stage investigator questions, I know we had a team where somebody was a collaborative PI and was an early stage, but was not the lead. And there was a question about, should they use that, that opportunity for this? Or should they do their own proposal, which they were planning? So talk to us about this. This is, again, we can give a lot of really helpful, you know, we can't make the decisions. Those are yours. But we can talk you through as to what's the strengths, what data spends more time worrying about this than anybody I know, and making sure that people don't get the best deal they can out of it. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would just say, you know, always just in general, make sure your ERA comments account is always up to date and you're appropriately sort of marked with your early stage investigator status. Um, especially, uh, I think, too, on the NIH side, just want to note um, I have found a common um, underutilized sort of thing with early stage investigator status is. Um, individuals who took time off for birth uh, of a child, 
caregiving, etc. And there's a process by which you can request an extension of your early stage investigator status. You don't want to do that the month before or right <laughs> after your early stage <laughs> investigator status has lapsed. You want to keep up with that, and I highly recommend utilizing that just overall for NIH in general. Um, in terms of the, the issues, there's the MPI, COI issue, and so again, talk to your program officer when you come over to NIH about that. The other, I think, thing that seems to be a bit tricky sometimes in the change of the application is sometimes the budgets. And again, that's something that talking with your program officer to adjust sort of the salaries, because how that happens on the NSF side when you're forming that application and then how it translates to the NIH application is a little, it can be a little wonky sometimes. And so we get a lot of times that the, the PIs are putting their applications in and they wait for the last minute and say, well, the budget is an issue and I can't submit it. So always start early and make sure you're talking to your program officer. So yeah, I have to share a few um, points in the one for the first of these submissions in NIH. One is it's really about the formatting because first time you don't know in the 10 to 12 pages to 15 pages where they're going to stay. So, but that was quickly addressed by you know the NIH staff, which is very helpful. The, the second point that was not uh, clear was me to me was that the uh, mock reviews I think something we don't understand how that will work because initially I know I guess some. Uh, you know, maybe that's something. Um, when, I, when we submit to AIS, we know we were we know there's no additional review process. But then I'm kind of trying to track that state of the, the, the submission at some point. It has a it has a person tower there. I was like, where did this number really come from? You know, the no reviews or so so now it's clear to me, but at that moment I was I don't really know how this component really works. So. This number is where that come from uh, at the NIH side. Yeah, um, but this was the side. And for all of you, we're also taking notes as we're doing this. So uh, we keep updating our processes to, to make these things easier for folks as we go. So just so you know, we're kind of a learning system here. Yeah, thank you. So my other suggestion is to you here because Ben and I are coding this program at the NIH side. So if you have any questions, Send some email to me or Bama or Natalia. So, uh, I will try my best to answer. If if I cannot, I will send the question to to the best person I know who can provide the answer. Um, yeah, I have asked you last number of questions. So I think we should be able to to our audience and people attending the virtual. So uh, now I'm taking questions from the audience. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. This was very, very informative and helpful session today. I really enjoyed it. So I have three questions. So the first question is that you know, I completely agree, as you have just stated, for a good grant, it needs to be very well written, it needs to be very curated, good community there, budget, everything, you know, that you have just mentioned. But this whole process takes some time. It cannot be achieved in one year or three months or two months, or especially those PIs who are just joining, like early careers or finishing their postdocs and starting their position. So one thing, like it's a, it's a suggestion or a question you can take anyways, that NSF and NIH, are they doing anything to send any messages to the institution that they don't pressure early career investigators to start writing grants from the very first month of the appointment? So, you know, there's a pressure always to, you know, those investigators are very appreciated who are submitting in the very first month of their appointment the grant. So, you know, to, to write a very good, comprehensive R01, including team, data, budget, everything which you have just stated, it takes time. And also, you want to see the bias of the investigator. You must have some papers out on the field. 
if we submit a paper to a journal, a good journal, which you want us to publish, it takes sometimes six months to one year to get an article out. So approximately the time is required. So is there anything happening in this regard? Okay. Um, so uh, what institution are you at? What institution are you at? Rutgers. Pardon? Rutgers. Rutgers. So as somebody that um, is slightly more senior, I would encourage you to start writing proposals right away. And it's not pressure that you should be feeling, but it can take a while to, like I think one of the primary components as to whether something gets funded is um, how, how it's written. And that takes a while. If you wait until your second, third, fourth year to start that process, then you're going to, if you feel like you're feeling pressure in your first year, just wait till you're in your fourth year and you have, and you have no, no proposals, then you'll be feeling pressure. So there's a reason why like more senior faculty are encouraging assistant professors to start the process right away. I think it took me two or three years to get my first proposal. And I started writing from, from the first day. Uh, it, if you earned a position at the, as a faculty member, I was also on the, I was the chair of the search committee at the University of Florida last year. You've already have the publication list that should set you up to write a proposal. It might not be, there's different programs. So maybe Smart and Connected Health, you don't have the team together to submit a Smart and Connected Health proposal, but you do have the, the ability to submit a petition to like uh, NSF Small or an RO1. Um, you know, at, as a standing member, we see a lot of RO1s from faculty that are in their first, second, like third year. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, but it can take a while. So yeah, we, I would encourage you to start the, you don't have to do, I think the, the bad thing is trying to submit 12 proposals. This is bad. Like, because all of them are usually super crappy and then they all get rejected and you get frustrated. But I think if you submit like three proposals per year that you put a lot of time, effort, you got, you sought feedback on from senior faculty in your department or outside the department and so forth, I think that it is a learning process and you'll be said, you'll be so happy. Um, you, four years from now, will thank you right now for like starting the process early, starting uh, obtaining uh, funding early. So, yeah, that's all. So, so let me add to what you just said, sit on review panels. So NIH has an early career review, so you can apply to be on there, but you can't be on the study section, but you can go on review. NSF, you can be a reviewer at any point. So send a message, we have our, you know, our, we have our group email, Send a message. I wouldn't say a first year person should write a smart house. It's too much. Building that team takes time. But you might do that, you know, you might put in a small, you might put in other. Um, we have a lot of mechanisms that are smaller, and you might put in a smart house in the third year when you've got the team together, when you've got the things that you need. And you can also, I mean, we have we have assistant professors that get funded every year in smart health. But they've also shown they can build the team, they can pull the team together. It's hard. Day one, you can't tell them you can pull the whole team together. It's just too hard. Um, but you'll, your publications will show you publishing with these people over time. So be judicious. I think what Christine is saying is important, but be judicious about what you pick to apply to. Because if you big multidisciplinary or big interdisciplinary teams, we know from team science, they're hard on junior faculty. But you know, if you can pick more of a smaller area and a smaller size of work, you can really learn and sit on a review panel. Because I'm telling you, when you read eight reviews, eight great proposals, you will see eight different ways of writing. Yeah. And you will figure out, and you will find your own voice in that too. Because I will tell you, there are reviews that start with stories. 
Take a moment to start with the story. What? But occasionally you read the story and you go, oh my gosh, this is great. I'm hooked from day one, right? And then there's others that start just do, 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 do. I mean, everybody has a different way to do it. You need to find your voice. And that's how that doing, doing, sitting on the news and writing proposals helps you find that voice. All to say NSF and NIH have a vast set of resources to help people with learning how to write proposals better and having educational opportunities like webinars or grantsmanship workshops like and NIH, the Office of Academic <coughs> Research, has these opportunities that they generally do. But that, too, I think that, you know, I, I agree with Wendy. I would not out the gate recommend a smart connected health proposal. But I would recommend sort of things like this, coming and learning about it, thinking about who should be on the right team. Um, we work with NSF every year to put together an Australian PI workshop, and that's not just for those who are funded by the NSF uh, NIH Smart Connected Health Program, but those who are actually aspiring to join the program and submit applications. That's another opportunity, and I think um, for those who may be interested, this year that's going to be hosted in Washington, D.C. as part of the IEEE Chase Conference in November. So there are opportunities like that, and then I also think, too, it's um, really important to find the right sort of mentor at your institution who have experience. So there may be somebody who has, actually I know in the past there was somebody funded at Rutgers for Smart Connected Health. You know, finding those individuals who have that experience for what it is you're trying to do is also going to be helpful, even if it's just a set of eyes looking at your proposal. Uh, I was just going to add uh, two more points. Although you may not be a PI on the Smart and Connected Health, you can be a co-PI. Um, so if somebody, you know, uh, usually the research team, I know our research team at the university, in my college at University of Florida is very good at, if you see a, uh, an RFA and you want, you don't want to leave the, the team, but you want to be a part of the team, you email the him and he'll try and put you in touch with people that are submitting. Uh, from, you know, your home institution. So you can be a co-PI, and that can also help you see how a proposal is written. Like, you know, what does a proposal look like? What are the documents you have to be involved, that have to be submitted, and so forth. Uh, the other point that I was going to make is NIH actually had example R01s and R21s on their website. You can just Google NIH example R01, and they're, I think that they're enormously helpful. Um, whenever somebody says that they're going to be submitting an R01 for the first time, I tell them to go look at the example on the website because it, they're helpful. Thank you very much. Very helpful. So my second question is if I can ask answers. So the second question is like sometimes there are specialized FOAs or RFAs, right? So the authors or the PI try to write the grant following the information available in those RFAs. However, the comments of the reviewers sometimes are not aligned with the RFA. They are answering their, or giving the remarks based on their own you know, experience, but they are not looking at RFA by themselves. The PI is not writing something you know, sometimes you can write an R1 and, you know, that they, there are some calls where they can distribute to the relevant study section, but sometimes the study section is already defined over there. So then, I can name many, but in those situations, how you criticize reviewers that, you know, that these comments that you have given are good, however, PI is trying to address the problem requested in RFA. I, I and just point to some some right so if you look at the rfa if you open rfa there is a section five which is called review criteria and this is the only thing that nih reviewers look at so nih reviewers do not evaluate responsiveness to the rfa say so if they read the intention of the rfa all that 
they don't address those unless they are specifically spelled out in section five okay so if they do are spelled out in section five then the sro brings attention of the reviewers to those review criteria so again reviewers look only at the review criteria but then the uh, nih and here is what then uh, can correct me uh, the ICs look at the responsiveness to the RFA, right? But uh, NIH, but, but the review evaluates scientific and technical merit of the application as presented and as asked in Section 5. So, Talia, I think, too, um, it, maybe a little bit of explanation on sort of um, standing study section versus sort of uh, a a special emphasis panel, right. and I, I, maybe if you can describe the differences between sort of that and how that that works, because I think that that's something that is somewhat confusing. Sure, sure. Okay, so certain funding opportunity announcements have their applications reviewed in a regular study section. So a, man, a good example is the CATS award, which is actually all uh, also relevant to uh, the topic of our discussion today. This is an award for young investigators who change their direction. So certain FOAs are reviewed inside the study section, and then the SRO during this meeting attracts your attention to the specific uh, requirements, if any. And of course, the reviewers should have seen them before. But uh, other phase that are dedicated requests for applications, right, that are dedicated to a certain topic. And an example that I've been working with was um, include um, RFA for Down syndrome uh, people to help improve their you know, standards of life. Those are clustered and reviewed in, in separate review meetings. So uh, there is a whole review meeting called uh, Special Emphasis Panel, SEP, which is dedicated only to um, re review of applications submitted to a particular RFA or to a group of RFA, RFAs that are linked together uh, by certain subjects. That, that's the explanation you can for Dana. Mm -hmm. But NSF is different, so Marta will tell you about NSF. Right, so first, uh, I would encourage you to be a panelist so that you can see this experience firsthand. But the very beginning of the panel is really devoted to socializing with the panelists, making sure that they understand the review criteria, not only the general review criteria along with potential merit and broader impact, but also if there are any additional solicitation specific review criteria. That said, it can quite often be the case that certain panelists may go and add their own review criteria, and their own individual reviews, because they're human, right? We're human. Hopefully, when you participate in the panel as a panelist, you can catch yourself doing this, right? Because it's very, right, it's, it's very normal to do this. However, an NSF program director typically is very careful and looks at the reviews and tries during the discussion to really steer it towards the review criteria, reminding the panelists again and again. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that there cannot be diversity in the individual reviews. But where you want to see the, the substance of the discussion, you want to see that in the panel summary. That is the one that really um, where the panelists and the program directors spend a lot of time looking at it, discussing it, and finalizing it. You can read, you can learn how to read those panel summaries. If you can, you should reach out to the program director so that they can interpret those for you. In the panel summary, you may get the consensus of the panel uh, according to the, uh, along the review criteria. You may occasionally get a uh, sort of a loner panelist or two panelists that sit outside the others, but there are specific sentences there where you can get that information. It, seems, it says things like, um, a panelist or some panelists felt that. So that is sort of a signal that it wasn't a consensus, it wasn't broadly shared by all the panelists that reviewed and discussed your proposal, uh, but it was acknowledged and it was insisted upon by one or, or more out of the four panelists. So there are ways that you can interpret that panel summary. However, in the panel summary, typically, you get only a conversation or a discussion along the review criteria. Even that, I, would, I always tell the eyes, go and talk to the program director, because even uh, for the panel summary, the program director can tell you what you should be paying attention to if you decide to come back. 
what they elevate as important, right, or as what they prioritize for you to pay attention to. All feedback is interesting, but not all feedback is super important for you to go and, and follow up on in your second revision. And the, the program director is your magical source to figuring out what is the one, what are three or four most important things that you should be devoting yourself to. No, I agree with your point. My question was that an overview of the reviewer's comments, because now I'm not asking this question for myself. I'm myself a panelist in NSF and I have goals. I have a little bit of experience, but what I observed during those meetings, I'm asking questions based on those as well. So my last question is, you know, those people who are like, this is mainly for NIH, uh, you know, so early career investigators related to them. So some people who are, after doing PhD, they go to, for example, industry. They spend some years of time over there and they practice and learn some new technology and then join the academics. This way they, according to the research time, you know, that whether those years are also counted in the early case, like for example, if a person has done a PhD in Germany, he spent two years in France, and then he spent five years in Boston in a company, and now he is part of an institution, uh, maybe UConn or Boston University or something, and now become PI. And now with that window, he is early career investigator for only two years or only one year or four years. So, you know, he is losing a window of approximately doing research in academics for six years or seven years. So does the cap locks or starts when you finish your PhD regardless of doing research in industry or academia, or the cap starts when you become investigator? So Natalia can can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's ten years from when your PhD is conferred, uh, and it, it does not. There's no exception for if you go to industry um, and, and decide to come back. Um, the only sort of um, ability to sort of modify and ask for extensions has to do with um, things like caregiving and and other having time for. Um, you know, a health-related issue or those sorts of things, you can file for sort of an extension. But um, other sort of employment and, and whatnot does not uh, play into that. Natalia, am I correct? Yes, you are correct. Absolutely. It's 10 years since your last degree, MD or PhD, whatever it is. But actually, it's important to indicate that there is one more condition. You should not have had a major NIH grant, right? Once you receive your uh, R01, for example, as a multi-PI even, right? You can apply as co-investigator, that's okay. But once you have an R01 as PI or multi-PI, you are no longer an ESI, early stage investigator. Thank you very much for taking my question. I appreciate it. Yeah, I also want to mention uh, multi-PI uh, if you are multi-PI of the grant, you can do the ESI as well. So that's it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let me so we remind you. It's hard. So, it's so, uh, so our senior PIs and senior program officers uh, provided that. I think that this uh, information is invaluable. So unfortunately, uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm blaming the SMU organizers. So uh, hopefully it is recorded for this second can be shared. This information is very, very valuable. And it's valuable to both junior and senior class. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy, Natalia, and others. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, and thank you for